all, all set? All set to go. All right. Simon Stanisai is much more than an academic or an educator or a poet or an author or a teacher. He's a wonderful friend who came to America on a Fulbright scholarship. And I had the good fortune of meeting Zaman when my wife and I took a, uh, a class on Rumi over at UCLA. We became friends. I introduced him to Pacifica Graduate Institute where he still teaches. I think we're really fortunate here today to have Zaman among us who considers us among his friends. And he's going to talk to us a little bit this morning about Afghanistan. He's just a qual, I can't speak enough of him, but our lives are affected by the people we bring in. Zaman, welcome. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you for uh, the opportunity to be part of such a wonderful group. Um, I think there is uh, so much uh, positive energy here that I don't, I mean, aside from the fact that I've committed myself to a presentation, I just feel like I should just stay in your presence and listen uh, to all the wonderful thoughts that uh, permeate through through uh, the space that, that, that we occupy. And uh, in that sense, I think I might as well start with a, uh, a reflection um, that was uh, written uh, in 2014. Uh, it's a reflection on the um, opening chapter of the Quran. Um, and I want to share that um, to kind of bring everyone into a, a realm of a reality that is not necessarily within confines of our reach as far as our senses are concerned. In the name of the paracosmic consciousness, whose oneness of being pins the verses of perpetually unfolding multiplicities, whose essence weaves into every fiber of our existence as the wholeness of immeasurable timeless tomorrows. All praise is due to the infinite eternity whose love radiates through our soul, whose glory graces every grain of our being, and whose awe paints our fragile illusions. O oh, divine beloved, the ineffable shaper of transient temporalities and transcendent realities, Give us the thought that thinks thee. Give us a pleading heart that desires thee. A yearning that utters nothing but your love. Turn us into a longing that dies to dissolve in the harmonic convergence of your totality. Help us thread our pathways through the splendor of your enchanting gardens and idyllic meadows, where moments of your manifest beauty attains a foreverness all their own. Distance us from the dissonance of dark energy. Bathe us in the luminous glow of your countenance, light upon light upon light. When we think of our humanity and our humanness in it, 
we are nothing but a moment between memories of the past and aspirations of the future. And yet we often take that moment very lightly. As though we can tap into it whenever we want to. That is not so. There is a blessing in every moment. Not because uh, it is not going to return. But perhaps because of that, it has, it's a blessing in and of itself. So cherish the moment you're in, every moment. Unfortunately, we humans have lost uh, the, 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 the touch with, uh, with the moments. We are operating through uh, the dynamics of the triangle of power, status, and wealth. And that defines everything for most of us. And they are each very destructive. They are destructive to ourselves, but even more so to our communities. And it's ironic that we still call that our human evolution. If we haven't detached ourselves from power, status, and wealth, I think we have to call into question not only our evolution, but also our claim to civility and civilization. Um, I was thinking uh, what to share with you this morning. And I went to somehow my eyes fell on this uh, short paragraph that was also incidentally, coincidentally written in 2014. <clears throat> and it reads as follows. The loss of thousands of lives and trillions of dollars in America's longest military adventure has created what is perhaps the world's most corrupt state. At the same time, Afghanistan is a country with an estimated $1 trillion mineral wealth. Without proper structure and management, the country's fragile political structure presently held together by a scaffolding of American military and economic assistance could collapse into a failed state overnight. Um, this got published in the Huffington Post. And no matter how seriously I meant it, how seriously I meant to give that warning that the, that state could collapse into a failed state overnight. Um, I don't think even the editors bother to question it or to highlight it on, or to underline it. Um, sometimes we brag about how right we were in predicting things. And as much as that might feed our ego, that yes, I was right, I told you so, it also hurts. It hurts because uh, how often we ignore them, we ignore the warnings. Uh, perhaps like the uh, speed limit signs on the freeway. And sometimes you wonder whether that is meant to be the minimum or the maximum speed you are supposed to keep on the freeways. So um, I have been predicting this crisis in Afghanistan, not only in 2014, through the reading that I shared with you, but before it even started in 2014. 
21, uh, four days after 9-11. But of course, nobody listened, nobody cared, and who was I to be telling the think tanks that the path they were following was the wrong one. Um, I think that when we look at this uh, unraveling of the regime, and as I claim that it's, it was by intent, um, I think the best way to look at it is that if the warning signs are not heeded, then uh, somehow the intent does come into that. Um, let me uh, repeat the line that I um, started this with, is that the US invaded Afghanistan for the wrong reason and withdrew from Afghanistan after 20 years again for the wrong reason. Afghanistan had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, some of you might find this surprising and others might be wondering like, but how, then why did this whole game begin? Well, look at 9-11. The hijackers of the World Trade Centers were Saudis and Egyptians who hatched a plan in Germany and sharpened their flying skills in Florida and received a nod and a wink, at least from some officials, of a friendly Arab ally of the United States. So where is the role of Afghanistan in this? Well, let's go to Afghanistan. At that time, two decades of the Red Army invasion and the ensuing civil war had turned the country into a failed state. A failed state by every dimension, by every measure. Um, as the Soviet influence was waning in Central Asia and the rising Chinese influence had not yet engulfed the region, the power vacuum was too tempting for Washington to ignore. The US wanted to control the center squares of the Central Asian chessboard, and Afghanistan was right there. Afghanistan is where the CIA had dumped bin Laden. And so it was a convenient location waiting for an excuse to be invaded. When you look at it from uh, uh, the power structure and the games the militarists around the world play, that's what I mean by it. It was waiting for an excuse to be invaded because a vacuum was created and it, uh, if a superpower is super, they have to prove it. Uh, the Taliban government at that time was so out of touch with the 21st century reality that not too many would uh, would shed tears for, for them if their government fell. They didn't have any allies. The country was recognized only by three states, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the Emirat. Um, but when uh, push came to shove, Pakistan very conveniently and promptly switched sides and turned against them, siding with the United States. Um, so what else could the United States, especially the military in the United States want to fill that gap in Central Asia. Uh, 
And yes, there were voices of reason, mine included, but uh, they were shunned, they were ignored. Um, and I became a persona non grata in uh, any conference on Afghanistan, when in reality, prior to that, um, I, I, I was very, very active. But since I spoke against the US invasion, uh, the US planned invasion, let's put it that way, <clears throat> um, then uh, I was considered a Taliban sympathizer and ignored. Uh, what I suggested at the time was that Afghanistan had gone through 10 years of uh, civil war. Uh, there were, it had turned into fiefdoms and there were seven warlords, at least seven, who kind of had chopped off a part of the country and were controlling the various provinces. The Taliban came and reunited the country. Um, that is to their credit. The Taliban established a sort of law and order, uh, albeit that the laws they were talking about were seven centuries old. Nonetheless, they brought some degree of stability. That also goes to their credit. Um, but what happens after that? is that they're being out of touch with, with the reality of the 20th century. In a way, they held the country hostage. And we could have worked with them as there were voices heard from their rank and file um, of, of a, a rift, of a division, which is pretty common in, uh, uh, in, in political organizations uh, in, in their early stages of uh, uh, establishing power. Um, and, and my suggestion was that because the Taliban had unified the country, because they have brought stability, um, if we have a problem with them, let's, let's talk to them, let's negotiate with them. Uh, whether we recognize them diplomatically or not is a different thing. And I, I suggested that we could achieve a lot more by talking to them directly than overthrowing that regime and taking back to the chaos it was prior to that. Um, well, uh, the United States had a different plan. And their plan was that uh, they were bent on um, having a, military presence in Central Asia, the power vacuum I, I used to, I referred to. Um, but the problem was that they were using the blueprint of the Soviet invasion, an invasion that had failed. And the American military experts, I'm sure, knew exactly what had happened. So the Russians came to support a communist regime that was failing. When they were blamed for the invasion, uh, they said, we came to end a civil war that didn't exist. So now they had to create one. So they armed, uh, uh, financed and supported um, the various ethnic minorities and then told them to go ahead, fight the majority for your civil rights. And voila, you got a civil war. And now the Soviet Union could justify its presence because it was there to stop that civil war, the civil war that they created and that they fueled. Well, um, I think Winston Churchill had said that the Americans will do the right thing after they have tried everything else. So the Americans tried to 
do that first thing. They, they had tried to do everything else. They invaded Afghanistan from the north, like the Russians. They employed the, those same warlords that the Taliban had kicked out of the country. Now they were going to do the dirty work for the Americans. They were going to do the footwork. They were going to do the killings and the massacres and everything else that for which they have been uh, accused, uh, not by just by Afghan sources, but by the international community. So these warlords became um, criminal elements who had violated international law in several instances. And the next thing was the Americans wanted to create a, a democracy in Afghanistan. And in so doing, they first violated the main principle of what a democracy ought to be. And in a, a democracy and a nation building, which was their motto, although uh, President Biden is denying we went there for nation building, that's what Americans were bragging about. Um, uh, they, they ignored the principle of the majority rule. They followed the Russian blueprint um, in, in supporting, financing the, uh, the minorities <clears throat> and vilifying the majority. And this was supposed to be a democracy. Now, <clears throat> just like the Russians wanted to uh, create a reason for their invasion, the Americans did exactly the same thing. Um, if it was Al-Qaeda, it was dismantled. So then the United States had to withdraw troops and uh, consider that a mission accomplished. Um, as George Bush would uh, do his Hollywood version of it uh, down uh, in the harbor in San Diego. Um, but um, as I said earlier, if, if that was the actual mission, the mission was accomplished, but the mission was different. The mission was to uh, have a, a powerful superpower presence in Central Asia. And for that, they had to have a reason for staying in Afghanistan. And the result of that was that they created, the, they created an enemy from within Afghanistan. The, uh, the enemy was, uh, in reality, the Pashtun majority in the south, but they labeled it as the Taliban. Uh, the, most of the operations, the American operations were bombing sorties. Most of the bombing was done in the south. It turned the country into two parts. The north that is prospering, and the South that was continuously destroyed and bombed, bombed by the Americans, and of course destroyed uh, quite often by, uh, by the opposition, by the Taliban, uh, who would uh, blow uh, bridges and destroy roads and other um, uh, communication and logistics, uh, uh, places that would affect logistics and the military operation. So uh, the, uh, that was pretty much the same thing the Russians did. Uh, so the Russians also destroyed the south and at one point they were intending to move even the capital to the north. Um, and that was also the reason why the south, uh, the, the Afghanistan produced the largest refugee community in the world in 1980s, five and a half million. Again, most of them were from the South. So like I said, the Americans followed the, the blueprint of the Russians, of the Soviets, and, uh, and, and kept on doing that by you know, bombing and destroying and targeting the South. And this drove a lot of people um, uh, uh, to the Taliban side. Well, uh, 
I, I, I should say that uh, after the, the US invasion, the Taliban's dwindled and pretty much disappeared. And by 2002 and 2004, they were not uh, anywhere. Uh, visibly or or in any 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 in any sense, um, the few uh, in the leadership who uh, were there, um, they approached the Afghan government, uh, and perhaps indirectly the Americans, that they were ready to participate in the Afghan government. The United States had chosen to form this minority government from any person. Uh, in the political spectrum of Afghanistan. Former communists of every shade were in the Afghan government. Uh, uh, religionists, if I can call them that, Islamists, they were there. Every minority was there. Every regional power was there. Everyone was there except the Taliban. Because if the Taliban would have joined, then there was no reason for the United States to continue. So we had to keep them as the enemy. And uh, that's where, where, where things uh, went from bad to worse. And after they were rejected, they were not allowed. Uh, and, and in a way, we fueled the civil war in a way, uh, telling Afghans who their friends and who their enemies were. And so they had to turn on each other. Well, not in some kind of a guerrilla warfare, but most of the military operations carried by the US supported government in Kabul, um, they were manned by the minorities and they targeted the majorities. And of course, not in as blunt terms as I'm telling you, but with, with the appropriate uh, Political, uh, political correct, uh, politically correct terminology. Uh, we are fighting the terrorists and we are fighting the uh, extremists, the fanatics, and we are uh, fighting the Taliban. We are bringing stability and we are bringing democracy. Um, so the, the government that they established was basically a facade for a deliberately corrupted bureaucracy. Now, uh, underlining word is deliberately corrupted bureaucracy incentivized through the CIA bribery. The, I would say upwards of 95% of the high ranking officials of the Afghan government were on the CIA payroll. Uh, they were openly called hospitality pay. Okay, so an Afghan official would be receiving his or her own salary, and they will be getting the hospitality pay from the Americans. And once you create that kind of an incentive, uh, when the time came that uh, they considered uh, uh, withdrawing American troops, who would want the Americans to go? They were the ones who were paying all their bills, if we can call it that. In addition, the, the genius of George Bush wanted to create a middle class uh, in Afghanistan that would be more amenable to corporate capitalism. Prior to that, the uh, income per capita in Afghanistan was for the most part around $200 per year. Where it stands now, uh, I'll get to that. But, but overnight, they created millionaires at the expense of the American taxpayers. Uh, and um, this money was paid not only to the government officials, they were, money, uh, they were paid to uh, those warlords who held the American troops. Uh, some of them were personally getting uh, checks of uh, up to eighty thousand uh, dollars, and we are talking about the Afghan economy. And I've heard 
figures larger than that as well. They became so corrupt that these uh, fiefdoms that were established around the country uh, threatened the, um, the stability of the country uh, because these ethnic fiefdoms were at the heart of the centrifugal forces that continuously challenged the central government authority. Sometimes if the president appointed a new governor in a province, a warlord will come and kick the governor out and he says, well, this is my area of responsibility. I'm the governor. And because uh, the United States used these warlords as a counterweight to offset, uh, offset the Afghan government's position on issues where there wasn't much compliance or agreement between the American side and the Afghan side, then the Americans and sometimes other regional powers will intervene and support the warlords against the central government. Uh, a flagrant case was one where one of these warlords was caught with 52 million dollars in cash. Let me repeat that, 52 million dollars in cash. When he arrived from Afghanistan in the Dubai International Airport and the Interpol, the International, Poli uh, International Police uh, caught him and they were going to take him to jail or do whatever uh, procedure was. And a phone call came from you know where, and they let him go with his cash. Now, these warlords have become landlords, in essence, uh, landlords in uh, one of the most lucrative real estate markets, that is the Dubai. They own hotels, they own you know, large uh, buildings with with uh, condominiums and uh, uh, but apartments and all that, and um, uh, they also have invested heavily in Istanbul. So when we talk about the trillion dollars that the Americans have spent in Afghanistan. Uh, the, tri the trillion dollar, four trillion dollars went in the name of Afghanistan, but they ended up in Istanbul, they ended up in Dubai, and they ended up in many Western banks. And many of these officials that the Taliban so correctly point to their, to their level of corruption, they have huge bank accounts in Germany, Canada, United States, and elsewhere. Uh, the political scientists have been arguing for some time now that the hegemonic overreach driven by a messianic sense of mission uh, is the main cause of the US foreign policy failure in Afghanistan, uh, perhaps elsewhere too. Um, and as far as Afghanistan is concerned, the US State Department and the Pentagon uh, didn't see eye to eye on most of these issues. Um, it's presumed that the State Department wanted a, a political solution to the crisis. But the generals had to earn their medals. And you earn them faster and quicker with more retirement benefits. If um, you have been on the field in the battle. And uh, I think at one point, somebody pointed Af to Afghanistan as uh, the, the four general, uh, four star general making factory. A lot of these uh, generals go to Afghanistan, they come back uh, in earning their uh, four star general rank. Um, and so when you look at it that way, then you understand also why, why the war took so long. And if they had it their way, 
it would probably still have been going on. Uh, but the other problem was that due to uh, that, that overreach that I referred to, that in the Cold War, uh, I think the best part of the Cold War was that the third world countries had an option. If the West didn't pay attention to them, they looked to the East. And if the East didn't pay attention to them, they looked to the West. And the East and the West were so entangled among themselves during the Cold War that the Third World had a little room for breathing. Now, once the Cold War was over, um, most of them were at the mercy of the most aggressive of those superpowers. The Soviet Union had collapsed. And in a pretty short time, again, in historical context, a pretty short time, the United States ended up um, having what footprint, bootprint in uh, at least seven countries in the Middle East. That would not have been possible if the Soviet Union had been there because they would have been challenged. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, keep going. And so um, because of this overreach, um, the United States had to uh, uh, increase the recruitment into the armed forces, but there weren't enough qualified people. So they had to lower the standard, the requirement. And in the process, a lot of rogue elements made their way to the armed forces and put on the military uniform of the United States. Um, some of these uh, rogue soldiers were responsible for things such as uh, body part trophy hunting in Afghanistan. Uh, pretty much shooting um, anyone they wanted. Uh, so long as you call them the Taliban, uh, there will be no questions asked. Uh, burning and urinating on the corpse of the enemy. And then, of course, uh, uh, if we owe something to the smartphone, it would be these recordings that ended up on, uh, on the social media. Uh, of uh, how insulting the invasion itself was how uh, um, uh, un uncultured these new invaders were. Um, some of these rogue soldiers went on shooting sprees, such as the one in the Panjwai district of Kandahar, where uh, one of the soldiers who was drunk uh, took his machine gun and, and went out and uh, in the nearby village, uh, he entered every house he could find and, and start shooting, killing men, women, children who were awake, asleep, it didn't matter. And he got away with literally with a slap on the head. The worst sentence uh, that was uh, given to one of the soldiers was a, a year and a half, uh, present time. Uh, or the bombing of the uh, children who are gathering uh, firewood uh, in, in the Lagman province. And uh, when they found out, the, the people who were checking the satellite uh, images from Colorado uh, saw there were men carrying guns on their, on their shoulders, but these were children who were collecting uh, wood for fuel, for, you know, firewood. Uh, they didn't have electricity. And uh, if you think this was bad, then our general bet Betraeus, as the Arabs would say, or General Petraeus, went to the press conference and had the audacity to say that some Africans wouldn't mind having their children killed because we Americans give them a big compensation for their, for the loss of life. Um, or the bombing of the uh, 
Doctors Without Borders Hostel in Kunduz province, that when the war began, um, the doctors, Europeans, Americans, French, knew what was going on. So they sent the, the exact coordinates of the hospital to the American forces. Says here we have a hospital, uh, just uh, make sure you don't hit us. And the American forces went and bombed exactly that same hospital for which they had sent the coordinates. Um, so when you look at these, there were blunders after blunders. And these drove people to the opposition, whether you call them the Taliban or not. But if someone comes and, uh, uh, because someone had reported, and of course there would be personal vendettas and things of that nature. And, and the American forces came in the middle of the night, uh, breaking down the doors and taking your father, your brother or sister or whatever, and then uh, what's left for you in life? So these were the people who joined the Taliban. Um, these were the people who, uh, on the one hand, you could uh, be sympathetic with them, and, and we should be, because they were denied school, they were denied education, they were denied living in, in, in a proper setting in a, in a city, um, uh, buying in a market, anything that any civil society would have. These poor, poor people for the last 20 years were in the mountains. They were in the wilderness. They had never seen schools. Most of them are illiterate. So when they come to power now, and they don't even know how to run a government, how to control traffic in an intersection, for instance. And all they know is that the, the Kalashnikovs and the AK-47s and the other machine guns that are given to them. They know the guns, nothing else. Gun is power, gun is discipline, gun is your identity. They may look like they are way out of, I mean, totally out of this world and out of this century, out of this time, and they are. But we deny them the opportunity to be integrated into the Afghan society. We deny them the opportunity to be part of the government because we needed the enemy. And we contributed to their numbers through our negligence. And so when the Taliban came uh, back in August and took over the country uh, in, in nine days, I don't think Hitler's blitzkrieg operation was uh, faster than this. And I, I don't mean to compare it from any other point except that, that this military operation was faster than anyone could imagine. The best estimates, estimates by the CIA was that Afghanistan may fall within six months, may, but it was only nine days. And the reason was that that house of court collapsed because that government, again, it was undermined by the Americans. Their loyalties were bought through cash. And their sense of uh, nationhood, the nation building we wanted, um, that, that was uh, destroyed uh, by, by uh, encouraging warlordism in Afghanistan. Uh, some of the best buildings you find in Afghanistan now are the tombs of those warlords who have been turned into great mausoleums that you would think these are probably from you know, historical mausoleums that uh, the, the equivalent of either say Mount Rushmore or uh, uh, obelisk in Washington, uh, something like that. So they were no good when they were alive and they are not good, no good when they are dead because most of the money was, if they spend any money in Afghanistan, it was spent on those. Otherwise that money ended up uh, uh, in Dubai and in, in Istanbul and elsewhere. Uh, 
so uh, where where we we stand now is that the the government of Pakistan, as I mentioned earlier, uh, switched sides very quickly and turned on the Taliban, whom they had established and whom they had supported. But uh, then when it started supporting the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda, the US simply looked the other way. You know how they tell us that we have the intelligence, we have the technology, that we can read a license plate uh, uh, you know, from from the high position of a satellite, and here is a man who is uh, uh, seven feet tall, with uh, some kind of a uh, medical equipment attached to his body, who's going uh, cross going across the mountains that we were bombing, and we did not see him cross into Pakistan. It reminds me of a, a joke that uh, a little kid who had, for the first time, sneaked into a theater in Kabul. And uh, when the movie began, there was fighting and uh, the, uh, the main character of the story fell to the ground. And this poor kid who was seeing this for the first time said like, oh my God, they killed him. And his friend said, no. They can't kill him because if they kill him, the movie will be over. Okay, so yes, they couldn't kill bin Laden because if they had killed bin Laden, bin Laden, the movie would have been over. So he's not only allowed to cross over to the other side and he's housed in, 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 in a very obvious place right next to a, a military base uh, in near the capital of Pakistan. And you are telling me the US intelligence didn't know. Uh, so uh, these were the games that were played uh, because the American public not only has a short uh, attention span, but the United States is such a beautiful country. It's such a big country that um, uh, we, um, the, most of the other countries around the world do not register. They, they do not appear on our radar. And so mm, some of the things that I refer to, I'm sure most of you have uh, uh, forgotten. And the, the most of Americans have, have no ideas that this is what's happening. It's happening in their name, with their tax dollars, and with their lives. And so now the United States is willing, uh, they are giving signals that they are going to recognize the Taliban. And now when I go to all the time that uh, I was considered a Taliban sympathizer in 2001, and when I was suggesting that we uh, negotiate with them, uh, we are doing that um, trillions of dollars later and tens of thousands lives later. And what, what do we have in Afghanistan? It's just like if you go full circle from a destroyed country to uh, an, uh, an established democracy that, was, uh, uh, that had a lot of corruptions, it had a lot of problems, no doubt. But um, as I pointed earlier, many of those problems were by design. Dr. Danizai, we, we have about 10 more minutes. I'm going to finish in about 10 more seconds. So let me stop here. Okay. Uh, do you want to have discussion or questions? Uh, if the questions are easy, I'll be glad to. But if they are difficult, then that's a different story. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if you wish to open the floor for questions, uh, I would ask the group if they have questions. Questions for Dr. Stanislav. I didn't want to stop you. I just wanted to let you know the time was. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, I could 
go on and on forever. Well, you and I'm glad you continue did. Continue for the next 10 minutes. I just wanted to let you know we're running up against the hour. Uh, uh, we could probably entertain some questions and then uh, 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 I think that that might be covered. Okay. Uh, uh, I see Jenny has a question. Can you unmute, please? Yeah. Yes, uh, good morning. Excellent, excellent historical perspective. Thank you. A friend of mine is reading a, a book from an Afghanistan writer, and she was telling me yesterday that this writer uh, writes about the history of, uh, of Afghanistan when everything was good. And he has written other books about that. And I wanted to know what is your feedback as to um, how life uh, was before the invasion, before the Taliban and all that? How was life before all these problems emerged? Um, we had Afghans who were going uh, to uh, the the Gulf area uh, to have dinner, flying from Afghanistan. They could afford to fly there with a party of 20, 30, whatever, uh, eat in the most expensive restaurants there, you know, have belly dancers entertaining them and uh, whatever else that they fund they could have there. And they come back right to Afghanistan. Um, but then we had people who were, if not starving, they were on the verge of starvation. Um, a lot of the money that went um, in, in every way possible, these warlords would uh, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, well, let, let me give you another one. One of the reasons that people say that oh, uh, there was a 300,000 Afghan army how were these uh, few thousand poor Taliban riding motorbikes able to defeat the 300,000 army? Well, uh, among the many ways that we distributed money, we would give money to many of these warlords who were supposed to be paying the salaries of uh, the soldiers who were supposedly recruited into the national army. And so the warlords had every incentive to uh, in, uh, show a large number that here I have uh, 5,000 soldiers in this province and the Americans would pay them the salary of the 5,000 and there would hardly be 1,800 people there. And so they will pocket the rest of the salary and uh, just put some initials on a list that uh, the, the, the soldier received the pay. So they were milking the system. And if I knew it, I'm sure the Americans knew this. Uh, so this was the degree of corruption in Afghanistan is beyond belief. Um, it was uh, rated as the most uh, corrupt government. Uh, I think only Somalia uh, did worse. So Afghanistan was number two from the bottom. And, and uh, we, we, uh, we run that system. We operated that system. Um, we interfered uh, plenty in, in that system, uh, sometimes to undermine the authority of the central government and sometimes be, because we had to do things our own way. So if yeah. American troops had to go from one place to another, they would block right. the streets uh, from one end of town to another. Um, you, couldn't, you couldn't do a thing. And because the Afghan officials were part of that uh, system, many of the Afghan, uh, you know, like sometimes you would say that the, the streets in downtown Kabul would be closed for an hour, an hour and a half. What is it? Well, the assistant to the Minister of, Ministry of Interior is going to the parliament. So if he's going to the parliament, you block the streets. His entourage will have eight or nine bulletproof oh. huge SUVs. And he so, would be in one of them. So you, even if someone wanted to attack, they, they wouldn't know 
which of those huge SUVs to attack uh, so that, that he would survive. If that's how much you, how much distance they created between themselves and the people in whose name they ruled, they governed, uh, then it was no wonder that people saw them as part of a, a corrupt regime and a puppet regime. The, the, thank Their you. Lie more, mostly with the West rather with, with the people. Thank you for the response on that. I have another question from Whitney. Can you take that question, Whitney? Yeah. I'm, um, what was your career? I don't, uh, I don't understand. Are you an author or a, working for, who, who did you work for? What was your career? Who are you? Uh, well, uh, the only time I worked for um, anything that you would consider the Afghan government is when I was a professor at the Kabul University, which was a state university. I had never worked for the Afghan government other than that. And uh, I was a, a Fulbright scholar. I came here to the University of Washington. Uh, and um, when I was uh, granted an additional pro uh, uh, funds for, for my PhD program, they called me back. They said, we need you come back to Afghanistan. And I went to Afghanistan to teach linguistics. But uh, when I arrived there, they said, sorry, we had closed the departments. Uh, so uh, anyways, so um, my, uh, uh, my career is in academics. Um, and I, I do write uh, things that nobody reads or not too many people read. Um, uh, and I think in a way to indirectly answer one of the questions uh, uh, that was hinted earlier was that uh, I, um, I helped, uh, I translated the book uh, Dancing in the Mosque, uh, which was published by HarperCollins uh, London and HarperCollins uh, New York last year, it's in Amazon. Um, and we worked on a second book that I, I finished the translation of. And when we uh, talked to our agent, they said, uh, I'm sorry, but um, there's not that much interest in Afghanistan. We can publish probably the most four books for the whole year. Okay. Four uh -huh. books. So if that's how much attention is paid to Afghanistan, um, uh, it, it's basically ignored. Um, uh, people don't read on it. Don't, people don't write about it. Um, yeah, but but I, I'm a writer and uh, a professor. If, uh, okay, well, thank you, Dr. Stanzai. On that, we have a lot of questions sort of backing up here. So I'd like to move on to that. I'd like to go to Patricia. Are you unmuted, Patricia? Yes. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Stanisai. I'm wondering how we can help considering their, their infrastructure yeah. has been damaged and people are feeling hungry and more with the winter, harsh winter there. Um, there are many organizations who are helping uh, partly because the Taliban government is not capable uh, of, of helping and also because uh, there were funds uh, uh, from international community and from the US that were supposed to be going to Afghanistan, um, and, and uh, they may have included some, uh, uh, so, some portion of that might have been for uh, uh, humanitarian help. Uh, now, um, the United States and the West had frozen all those funds. Uh, they are not giving any of that to the Taliban, and the Taliban are in this uh, uh, kind of a game with the West. The West says you have to um, uh, make an all, uh, a more inclusive government uh, so we can recognize you politically, then we can release the funds because the government right now is under the total monopoly of the Taliban. And the Taliban says, well, this is our tradition, whatever that means, um, that you're interfering in our politics and uh, if our people are starving, uh, you're responsible for it. So it's a, it's a very, um, uh, it's, it's a terrible game uh, and, and they, they are playing their political game. And in the meantime, people are suffering. 
I think I had given the name of one organization that was uh, established in Holland, and I think they are giving funds, uh, helping in Afghanistan. It, it, that's yeah. one of the many. Uh, the only reason I mentioned that was because it's uh, someone I know. Um, uh, okay. So so that's where we are. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to go to Bill. Uh, your question, Bill? Yes, thank you, uh, Michael. I'll be very brief here. Um, I just wanted to, in terms of making sense of this on a, a geopolitical uh, level, I'm just wondering if you're familiar with the work of Danny Sheehan, who I had a chance to hear his um, course at uh, UC Santa, Santa Cruz um, recently, a, a recording of that. Are you familiar with his work at all? Uh, no, I'm not. Let me make uh, send you information. I think you'll really appreciate, and, and you guys could even collaborate in some way, perhaps. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Afton, do you have a question? Um, yes. Uh I've, this is the third time I've listened to you, and I'm deeply moved. I, I feel an extreme connection with Afghanistan because I've had Afghan hounds for about 55 years. Uh, but my question is, this is so dark and discouraging. Do you have a vision of a way out? Um, I, I've predicted a lot of situations, and... Um, this is one which is uh, kind of difficult. I, my assessment is that things are going to stay the way they are for, for a long time. Uh, the Russians had their fingers burnt. They're not going to come back. The Chinese operate in a, a little different way. The Americans had already given up. Uh, so it's probably for the most part up to the regional um, uh, proxy powers to uh, who, who very actively interfere in Afghan politics, Pakistan and Iran in particular. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's a disastrous situation. Uh, if um, a, a kind of a domino of the Central Asia begins, uh, for which Iran is uh, very desperately trying, um, and, and if that takes hold, and, and the unraveling begins, it won't be only the unraveling of Afghanistan, but the entire Central Asian region. Um, so it's gonna be a great disaster. The other thing is that the Taliban are uh, so out of touch with the reality. They are not compromising on anything. Uh, and uh, if we use the measure of how other revolutions, the French, the Russian, the Iranian, the Chinese revolution happen. Uh, revolutions usually go through this uh, uh, stage of uh, extremism. And uh, I'm uh, thinking that uh, the Taliban are very extreme already and they might become even more extreme. Uh, and that will drive a lot of people out and uh, turn people against them. Uh, it's going to be bloody. I, uh, as much as I would not want to make a prediction, but that's that's what I see. Uh, that there is enough regional interference, and there is enough extremism among the Taliban themselves uh, that uh, I, I don't see the future um, uh, of uh, any peace in the, in the future of Afghanistan, at least in the next five years. 